What can we do to reverse global warming? Become aware of the solutions and think about the actions you can take as you listen to how we are drawing down in Pennsylvania. The land use section of the drawdown book reminds us that there are two ways to reduce the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. One method calls for significant decrease in human cost emissions, and the other method is the widespread adoption of land and ocean practices that sequester carbon from the air and store it for extended periods of time. These solutions include, but are not limited to, forest protection, peatlands, afforestation, bamboo, and the focus of this podcast, perennial biomass. To start, Dr. Armin Kamanian, Associate Professor of Production Systems and Modeling in the Department of Plant Science at Penn State University, begins with an overview describing what it means to sequester carbon and why this is important when talking about reversing global warming. Carbon is one of the freaks that make life possible. So all of us are made up of carbon in a good part. Were we to remove all the water from our bodies, 50% of them probably will be carbon. The same happens with plants. Plants also are composed when dry by about 50% by just plain carbon. And they get that carbon from the air, from the atmosphere, where it is in tiny concentrations, right? You know, 400 parts per million, that's enough to have quite an impact on climate. And plants take the carbon, and when they, you know, we harvest some of that carbon as food, but some of that carbon also dies with the plant, and some of it remains in the soil. And that part that remains in the soil is what we call sequestration. Another part that doesn't remain in the soil, that is more perhaps palpable, is wood. So wood storage is also a form of carbon sequestration. Dr. Tom Richard, Professor of Agricultural and Biological Engineering and Director of the Institutes of Energy and the Environment at Penn State University, emphasizes the relevance of carbon sequestration to the state of Pennsylvania. This topic is a really important one for Pennsylvania. The idea that there are some natural systems, forests and agricultural systems, where we can take advantage of plants and photosynthesis to really bring carbon that's in the atmosphere right now back to the land and to use that and utilize that and store some of it in forests and in soil, but also turn it into agricultural products or wood products. It's a very powerful technique. Plants have been taking CO2 out of the atmosphere for over 3 billion years. They've taken lots and lots out. All of our fossil fuel is from previous plant photosynthesis, taking CO2 out of the air. And so we know that they can do that at very large scale over long times. The question is, how well can they do that over the next few decades and century? And can we improve or accelerate some of that carbon uptake and utilization. And I think there are a number of ways that that can happen. So here in Pennsylvania, we have lots of forest land, over 17 million acres. And that forest land is largely in stands of trees that have been harvested several times, sometimes through clear cutting, sometimes through what's more sustainable forestry techniques in more recent decades. And they're generally in an age class where they were harvested somewhere between 50 or 100 years ago, some of them more recently, but a lot of them are sort of middle age when they're growing pretty fast and they're taking up a lot of carbon, between one and two tons of carbon per acre per year, which is a substantial amount. And it translates into roughly three tons of CO2 per acre per year that we're able to actually turn into woody biomass, forest soils, leaf litter, other carbon stocks in the forest. And when we harvest those forests, we can turn that into building materials, into furniture, into other long-lived carbon products that can be part of our industry. 
So those are actually two different kinds of drawdown solutions, one of which is the natural solution of storing it in the ecosystem, some of that carbon, and then the second is using it in different ways. So I just gave you an example for forests where we can store it in trees or we can make furniture out of it. And both are really good. The nice thing about using it in wood products, especially building materials, is that they can last for many hundreds of years. Dr. Kamenian addresses the drawdown solution perennial biomass and why a perennial crop is better than an annual crop when it comes to reversing global warming. Perennial plants for biomass come with two, at least two climate benefits. So one is the carbon sequestration itself. Perennial plants, like perennial grasses, right? Imagine a plant of maize, but that is perennial. They develop large roots and they stabilize the soil. And some of the carbon that I said could be stored. It really happens at a really high rates with perennial plants in large part because the roots die and every year they are part of them are replaced and they increase the organic matter in the soil. A good proof of that is just the very fertile soils of the Midwest of the United States, that in large part they are the way they are because they used to be perennial grasslands. The other part, so that's one component. The other component about the ability to reverse global warming is because when we produce fuel from plants, here is the cycle. Plants take the carbon dioxide from the air, they grow, we harvest that carbon dioxide in the form of plant biomass, turn it into fuel, and then that we use that fuel and during the burning of the process we return that carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. The process is not exactly zero emission, but all the fuel that it used from biomass displaces fuel that could have come from fossil sources. And in that regard, that is probably the largest impact on global warming reduction, right? Through perennial crops is the offset of fossil fuels that happens through this process. Dr. Kamenian continues by sharing some of his research in the field of perennial plants. I've been working on bioenergy perhaps in the last 10 years heavily, and, and in particular in Pennsylvania, working with three perennial crops one is called shrub willow, so it's a woody short rotation crop, a short rotation woody crop as the expert in the field. So this plant is not like the willow plant, it's a shrub, create branches, branches up, similar to the one that we used to use for weaving baskets and things of that nature. And it's a plant that loves to be cut, essentially, in its natural environment. So we use that property of that plant, plant it, and harvest it every three years as wood. And that is a perennial crop. The wood can be used as a source of energy just by plain burning or through thermochemical or biological processes, liquid fuels, and you know, and there are other uses for it. He continues with the outcomes from his research on perennial plants in Pennsylvania. And what we have learned, one, is that for areas from Pennsylvania and north of us in particular, is a very productive plant that produces a lot of biomass with very little nutrient input. It really likes wet soils and really likes fertile soils as well. So in areas like Pennsylvania that may have a lot of manure application in soils because of the animal production, plants like willow really thrive, produce a lot of biomass. So that's one of the things that we learned. One of the interesting things about willow, at least one that I didn't know, you know, the things that you learn when you work, is that it starts using water very early in the season, usually when we have a lot of excesses of water. And so in that regard, it will be great. It's a plant that can essentially shave off what will be runoff and water that will be available for flooding very early in the season when nothing else is growing. The other plants are the grasses. Switchgrass, one plant that has become very popular, is a native from the U.S. It grows really aggressively and it's also a beautiful plant. It's another crop that produces a fair amount of biomass, but not in a woody form. It's an herbaceous production. So the advantage definitely the of a plantless switchgrass is that it can be harvested with conventional equipment for forage harvest. So that's very handy. We have a lot of that available. And it can be planted in soils that sometimes are a little rough for annual crop production. Dr. Kamenian continues with sharing advantages for perennial biomass. Each region has its advantages, its drawbacks. And I think in Pennsylvania, one of the advantages is water availability. Even though we have our occasional drought, in general, we have 
pretty general supply of water throughout the year. And that makes it very suitable for biomass production. We calculated that in the case of shrub willow, you know, one acre of shrub willow could sustain one car for a full year of driving, right, on an energy conversion basis. Just to give an idea to the listener, to, you know, how much energy are we talking about? Or one acre, at least one car. And that's the main advantage. We have the water to produce the biomass. You know, plants do use water. And of course, in areas that are restricted in water availability, producing biomass or uh, instead of food crop can be inconvenient. But in areas like ours, in which we have in some cases soils that are not that suitable for agriculture, they can be rocky, they can be steep, or they can be too wet. Those are the exact areas where biomass can be produced in large amounts for biofuel. With the research results, especially here in Pennsylvania, Dr. Kamenian is able to document has there been a dramatic increase in perennial biomass? They haven't been expanding or exploding as one may have expected given the advantages. And there is one single answer for that, and that is pricing. Producing, you know, it has a lot of ecological benefits and, and climate benefits to produce fuel from biomass, but it's slightly more expensive than fuel produced from other sources, and particularly fossil fuel. There is a gap there in the in the price that is needed to really push the system to produce more fuel from perennials. And that gap hasn't been closed. The U.S. in particular has been, in the last year, somewhat to the surprise of many markets, had an explosion in production of fossil fuels that has kept prices relatively low and, you know, essentially delayed the development of other technologies. There's the pricing. And then there's getting the products from producer to consumer. But the other is that the idea that markets, because there is a lot of people willing to pay for this more, let's say, sustainable fuel, don't have the mechanisms yet to pay for the fuel if they want it, right? So there is a resistance in the system to get from the producer to the consumer. Perhaps an exception now is California, that in the last years has been firmly establishing a market for renewable fuels and may serve as an example that will keep expanding and pushing into the perennial crops. I think that's the main Pricing will be the main aspect for um, liquid fuels or fuels coming from perennial sources that have kept them a little bit low in the usage compared with the potential. Despite the challenges in finding a place for perennial biomass, especially with the advancement of other renewable energy sources, one target for perennial biomass market is liquid feed production in addition to long-distance transportation fuel, such as jet and ship fuel. If there is a market for the biomass, the producers will be willing to produce it. I think land availability is not so much a limitation. For, For a producer, producing biomass is one option among the portfolio of things that they can produce. So if we want to make an extreme comparison, perennial crops can be produced in many areas. But the logical areas, for example, are those that may benefit from the production of the biomass. And which areas can benefit? Well, these perennial crops use very little nutrient per unit of biomass produced compared with annual food crops. So they have a very low environmental footprint and it's possibly a positive environmental footprint. So, so let's think one of the studies that we did in the Chesapeake Bay, where we to replace some of the cropland area with perennial crops, you know, that will reduce a fair amount of the nitrogen pollution in the bay. Dr. Kamenian continues with describing the benefits. It will also, in addition to benefit, reduce erosion and, and probably the phosphorus transport to, to surface water, so phosphorus pollution as well. So that's a case in which perennial biomass entering the landscape creates a benefit, right? Plus other benefits. You know, the areas are less disturbed. You know, they do create environment for some fauna, some plants to survive and increase biodiversity. But I can put the opposite example, cases in which the advancing of perennial or any crop really is just really not, not convenient or not advisable, which is removal of natural environments, so natural wetlands, natural forests, natural tropical forests, like, you know, happens in Indonesia or Malaysia now with palm oil in which replacing natural forests with any sort of crops 
seems as bad as an idea as it, as it can be as a climate policy and as an environmental policy. But in areas where we actually need to do the opposite, relax cropland and get a little bit into a more subdued rhythm with less nutrient use, perhaps the same water or more water use, but not so much nutrient inputs. And that's where biomass crops can be the perfect formula. To conclude, Dr. Richard revisits carbon sequestration in Pennsylvania forests and the role of our natural systems in drawing down carbon dioxide. When we harvest those forests, it keeps them young, which means they can keep taking up a lot of carbon each year. As a forest matures, it slows its growth, and eventually it reaches a steady state where it's not taking up that much carbon. So we're in a good situation in Pennsylvania because our forests are largely utilized, and there are many different products that we can use that will then keep the forest growing quickly. In agricultural systems, we also have an opportunity to use photosynthesis to help draw down CO2 in the atmosphere. In that case, that can be, again, a combination of products and soil carbon. In agricultural systems, there's not a lot of storage of carbon above ground because most of our grasses and crops degrade pretty quickly. We don't have big trees holding carbon above ground in those ecosystems but we can do a lot with the plant biomass that is produced, including making biomaterials out of it, including making bioenergy that substitutes for fossil energy. And in several cases, we can also develop cropping systems that increase soil carbon rather than deplete it over time. And so those are all good options. In Pennsylvania, we have over 28 million acres of cropland, over 17 million acres of forest land. If we combine those and we think about how much carbon we can sequester, it's somewhere between 25% and maybe as high as 40% of our carbon emissions right now that we could be actually using these natural systems to compensate for, substitute for, and eventually start to actually draw down atmospheric CO2 and reverse climate change. Although there are challenges in using plant materials to generate energy, perennial biomass is vital in reducing emissions when it comes to fuel production. By replacing annuals with perennials, the amount of carbon sequestration in soil is also increased, which brings us one step closer to reversing global warming. Thanks for listening. This is Anna from Penn State Brandywine.